Well, joking actually about, um, you know, prologue, learning Erlang is easy. It reminds me exactly, well, 10 years ago, I think it was in July uh, 2014, the very first Elixir Conf happened in Austin, Texas. And I was one of the speakers and I went up on stage and went and started off with, you know, you know what? You know, the, back in the days when they told you, you know, if you know C, learning C++ is easy, they lied. And then they came on and said, but yeah, guess what? You know, so, you know C++, learning Java is easy. They lied as well. And they kept on lying because then they came along and said, guess what? You know Java, learning Scala is easy. They lied. They were all lying. You know, you had to learn OO, you had to learn concurrency, uh, threads, I mean, you had to learn inheritance. You had to learn, uh, well, the type systems, not even, you know, Martin Odarsky himself understood. So it, it, it was, um, yeah, th they were all lying. And, and 10 years ago, everyone was saying, yo, guess what? You know Ruby? Learning Elixir is easy. <laughs> and I was actually went on stage and said, they're lying. <laughs> because if you want to really tr master Elixir, you need to learn concurrency and you need to understand concurrency and you need to learn how to think concurrently. The first Elixir book was out and, you know, by Dave Thomas and concurrency you know, had been relegated to, to the last chapters in the book. You know, it, was there, it was there, but it was in the back, you know, it was of secondary importance. And I remember Joe Armstrong jumping up and down saying, no, 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 the key point of, you know, of, of, of uh, Elixir is concurrency and the concurrency model. And you know, still today it is, even though you know, they've done an amazing job at hiding, I think, a lot of the, that complexity, you know, through frameworks. Uh, so, you know, if you do Elixir on a day-to-day -day basis, often you don't see, you know, the concurrency and the scalability and the reliability because it's all hidden, and all you do is you use kind of items under the hood. But you know, today yeah, I will be talking a bit about concurrency and kind of let you in into what, you know, makes, you know, Erlang and Elixir both scalable and reliable. You know, we've been telling the world. It's scalable and reliable for ages, but do we really understand why? And, and that's what we're going to discover. So, I mean, yeah, Joanna asked, you know, when did you start with Erlang? And, and this was kind of my first experience when, you know, the lecturer came in and waved the very first edition of uh, the Erlang book. It's the one which came out in 1993. And, uh, and he said, you know, this is the book, read it. These are the exercises, do them. And then off he went and lectured about the horrors of parallel programming. So it was a parallel programming course. Uh, he was talking about deadlocks, about mutexes, uh, semaphores, you know, corrupt memory, you know, threads crashing, causing you know, the whole system to crash. And we were young, we were still learning, and we were very, very scared. And so you know, when it got time to start doing the exercises, uh, we got, you know, the, the, the language we had to use was Erlang. And we had to create a simulated world with carrot patches, where you had little carrot patches growing. And then you had rabbits roaming this virtual world, eating the carrot carrots. And then you had wolves roaming around looking for rabbits to eat. And if a wolf uh, saw a rabbit, it would shout rabbits to other wolves you know, within a certain radius. And they'd all go in and chase the rabbit. If a rabbit saw a wolf, it would shout wolf to the other rabbits and it would run away, and if another rabbit found carrots, it would go in and say, hey, there's food here, there are carrots, come here and eat, and all the rabbits would then you know, scurry, off to, scurry off to the carrot patch and eat. And every carrot patch, every wolf, every rabbit was implemented as a process, as an airline process. And you know, I really kind of remember going in and typing you know, PS minus EF, expecting to see a process you know, for every, you know, for every wolf, for every rabbit, or a thread, actually, for every wolf, for every rabbit. But no, there was only, I think, three or four processes running. One was the shell, one was Emacs, of course. Uh, one was uh, the CPU load, one was um, the CPU load, the other was the clock, which you had. And, and you know, the, the, the fifth was the jam, you know, Joe's abstract machine, which was the VM we were using at the time. And, oh, and there was also T T T TCLTK, which was the graphical front end. And, you know, I didn't realize it, but, you know, it was, so it was, it was pretty impressive. I didn't realize it, but at the time, the deck workstation we, we were using could only handle 16 threads. 
But in doing this, it took about 40 hours, and we didn't come across any issues at all. There were no issues with bottlenecks, with deadlocks, with corrupt memory, none at all. And we kind of wondered, you know, why, why was, you know, why was the lecturer, you know, why, why did, it, you know, why was it, why, 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 why was he telling us that, you know, parallel programming is hard? What was so hard with it, you know? None of the stuff he kind of predicted have happened. And what I didn't realize is that, um, you know, the lecture was talking about concurrency models with mutable state. So that's basically the concurrency models we see today with Java and C++, where you got threads, you know, in shared memory. What he was talking about, what we used instead, were concurrency models with immutable state. So concurrency models where you have a process and only that the process itself is allowed to change and manipulate its memory. Processes outside you know, of the scope of this process are not allowed to go in and change it. They can send messages to you back and forth, but they can actually not go in and, and, and manipulate and change that memory. So, you know, so you know, th these were the two ways of doing concurrency. Now, let, let's go in and dig in into them a little bit more. So what happens if we have mutable state? So we're dealing with threads and the shared state gets corrupted. So, you know, what we need to do is we need to terminate all of the threads accessing. Well, sorry, let, let, let me step back a second. So, you've got two processes, you know, two threads. They're, you know, one of them is accessing the shared memory and something goes wrong with that thread. So it crashes. Your problem there is you don't know what's happened, what state it has left that shared memory in. It has probably gone in and left that shared memory in a corrupt state. And so that means you need to go in and terminate all the other threads which access that shared state and go in and recreate it somehow. So you know, it, 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 makes it, you know, it makes it very, very hard when things go wrong. And when things go wrong, they go very, very wrong. Um, Locality, what about locality? So pretend yeah, we've got a thread running in London and we've got a thread running in Melbourne in Australia. You know, where do we go in and place our shared memory? So yeah, that, that's your second problem with mutable state. Where do you locate your shared memory? And guess what, you know, assume you then all go in and agree, okay, let's put it in Dubai. Every time you know, London needs to access that shared memory, or Melbourne needs to go in and access that shared memory, there's latency involved. But not only that, you know, you have joked before, you know, that there are three certainties in life, you know, death, taxes, and network partitions. What happens if your network goes down? What happens if your network between London and Dubai goes down? All of a sudden, you can't access that shared memory anymore. Does that make sense, right? You know, and it, it, it's, um, and, and you have a problem, you know. And I'm not saying that shared memory and mutability are bad. They will work, and they will work very well on a single machine, and assuming you know, nothing goes wrong. And not only will they work very well, they'll be extremely fast. It will be extremely, extremely fast. You know, so, you know, there is a fit for this programming model, this concurrency model, with certain types of problems. Now, let's look at the same issues now with immutable states. So, with the approach we use in Erlang Elixir, right? So, you've got two processes. You know, processes don't share memory, and processes communicate with each other through message passing. Now, if a process crashes, the process will terminate and it will automatically clear the state. So even if that state was corrupt, but that process crashing and terminating, you're addressing and resolving a good part of that problem. Because, well, the other process doesn't really, yeah, doesn't really access that, that memory. So it can continue executing irrespective of other processes around it. 
yeah, they'll have their own copy of the data, so they'll just go in and continue executing. Is there a plug? I realized, yeah, there is no power. <laughs> and um, what about locality? Well, guess what? You know, we've got a process running in London, we've got a process running in Melbourne. They both have their own copy of the data. So you don't locate state, you copy it. So there's no worries about placing, um, about placing uh, you know, shared memory in Dubai. No, you have a copy in London, you've got, got a copy in Melbourne. And what happens if, well, if the network goes down? Well, it's fine. You know, London will continue working with its copy of the data. Melbourne will continue working with its copy of the data. When the network comes back up again, you then you know, start merging and joining together that data, usually you know, through, through you know, databases with eventual consistency. You could use CRDTs, thank you, or you know CRDTs, or yeah, or uh, or just doing it yourself, you know, with in there. Sorry. Or or well, no. <laughs> you would not use Mise in that way, no. But. Uh, yeah, but jokes aside, we did. Uh, we did test the running uh, NISA nodes in Melbourne, and Australia, and, and Sweden. And it was about, in the 90s, it was probably a kind of five second round time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, there was no way. <laughs> and the band was really, really bad, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe yes. <laughs> so, 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 so basically, yeah. If we go back a second, you know, I mean, there are two ways to do concurrency. If I step back a second, I'm using mutable and immutable states. Yeah, and it's the model you're know, based on shared memory and no shared memory. So those are the two models which you might have heard before. And even if you have shared memory, right, the right approach is to try to keep mutability within a thread and you know let that thread process that memory on its own so you know we we're, were seeing more and more kind of these functional paradigms you know go out and influence other programming languages and i think you know mutability i think is one of them which you know it's, it it is a property which has been part of functional programming forever which then you know is applied to concurrency which then is is kind of moved on and yeah, and then gets applied well, uh, also yeah, to, to variables, to functions, and, and a, wide other, a, a wide set of other areas. So, you know, including data structures. And, you know, the first time I gave a similar talk was actually in India, and I got on stage right after someone called Martin Thompson. Have you ever heard of him? So Martin Thompson is, he's, he's a friend of ours, he's a programmer. Uh, he's a developer who works in the city in London, even though he lives in Cornwall these days. And he's given a lot of talks over how he really achieves kind of light speed with Java. And you go in and listen to his talks and how he does it. He takes functional programming paradigms. He takes, you know, the Erlang and Elixir concurrency models and applies them to Java. So you'll have threads, you know, the, the threads, you know, receive small amounts of data. You know, the thread will manipulate that data and send out a response. And only that thread itself is allowed to change that data. So it doesn't need to put any memory locks as he's controlling, you know, he's controlling it, you know, through, through you know, th that way. And yeah, he just goes in and uses the, the techniques described. Now, with concurrency, we can take it a step further. And what we have, you know, think of distribution. If you start distributing a computation on two computers versus doing it on one, it will start probably going slower because you have latency. You need to send the data from one computer to another. You know, you will calculate everything and it will send back a response, right? So you'll slow down the one computation. What distribution gives you is the ability now to go in and do a lot of computations in parallel. And the latency will be most likely the same all the time. So, you know, it will slow down one computation, you know, through latency, but it won't slow down, you know, it, 
you can then do many, many computations in parallel. And that's how we now start getting a speed increase in, in the stuff we do. And again, you know, because there's no shared memory, because we copy the data across processes, distributing a program which was intended to run on a single machine onto a cluster of machines becomes, well, becomes really easy. You, you know, you, with very little changes or just by doing it right from the start. Does that make sense? Yep. And, you know, and, and when latency matters, you know, uh, if, if latency, you know, is important, you know, that's where edge computing comes in and that's where you try to, you know, execute stuff, you know, closer, you know, closer to the actual source of the data. So, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of that which will be happening and, and, and yeah, and which we'll be seeing about. But so, you know, why does all of this matter? Well, the Raspberry Pi got its first, you know, became multi-core in uh, 2015. I mean, the first multi-core mobile phone, uh, cell phone, you know, came out in, um, in 2011. I think it was an LG Optimus 2X and it had two cores on it. That's on one side of the spectrum. On the si other side of the spectrum is the HP Frontier, Enterprise Frontier supercomputer. So it's the fastest supercomputer in the world. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's at the Oak Ridge you know, Leadership Computing Facility in Tennessee in the US. And in total, it has about 9 million cores, okay? And I need to put on my glasses here because there's a lot of big numbers here, but it runs 1.102 quintillion operations per second. So it's three times more than its, you know, the, the, its, its you know, second in command, which is the Fugaku, which used to be the fastest supercomputer in the world. And if you wonder how much a quintillion is, it's somewhere in between a quadrillion and a sextillion operations per second. So it's, it's 10, 10 to the power of 18. And what does the Raspberry Pi, which has you know, the, the, the quad-core ARM processor and the GPU, and you know, the HP Enterprise Frontier supercomputers have in common? They're yes, well, they're multi-core. Not only are they multi-core, uh, they are kind of heterogeneous multi-cores. So they've got different types of cores. And, you know, if you think of it, you know, future architectures will have CPUs, GPUs, uh, they'll have graphical cores, heavyweight CPUs, lightweight integers CPUs, DSPs, cores for security, you know, networks on chips, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, IO cores, soft cores, uh, you know, and, and so on. So, you know, each core will be specialized and do something, you know, run things in a particular way. And it starts, you know, it starts becoming really, really complicated for developers, if you think of it, to, to start optimally utilizing these cores. And that's where, you know, kind of abstraction layers comes in, come in. And as a programming model, you know, I think we should stick to, you know, the concurrency model. And then, you know, we've got virtual machines, which will go in and detect code on the fly and understand, you know, what cores are best suited to execute this particular code. This is not something, you know, I mean, the, the, the whole shift to multicore is inevitable. And I mean, we knew, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we already knew that parallelizing legacy C and Java code is very hard. Debugging it is even harder. So you need a whole new mindset and a whole new approach to when you're, when you're, when you're dealing with this. And well, I think, you know, the, the concurrency model we have in the beam you know, has shown to work. You know, because we'll go in, we're going to hide this complexity. Just look at the JIT compiler, which came out, I think, in two, came out three years ago. You know, a tweet from the head of WhatsApp basically telling the world that just by upgrading to the latest version of, of the Beam and the latest version of Erlang allowed them to reduce their server needs by 30%. So, you know, Gone are the days when WhatsApp was trying to you know, have as many machines as possible, you know, have, have, few, have as few machines as possible, and as many users as possible on a single machine. You know, I mean, they're the ones who managed to get you know, 2 million TCP IP connections in 2012, if I remember correctly, right? On a single beam vir virtual machine. You know, Mark has told them, no, you need to move to you know, Facebook's data centers, 
uh, you need to start using virtualization. You know, so they're down from 2 million TCPIP connections to about 100,000. So you know, there the, are the hardware needs. And, you know, and obviously, the more layers you add between the hardware and your software, the slower your system goes and the less, more memory they use. So you know, just by upgrading to the latest version of the Beam, you know, they had a huge cost saving right there. So, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure, you know, we're going to see this also with all of the kind of future hardware needs as we go along. Now, how does all of this hang together? So we've got immutability, which is basically, you know, which is applied to concurrency. And what this means, again, only the process itself can change its state. And as soon as we've got that, we have another property, which is that of distribution. Because there's no shared memory, we can go in and put processes anywhere we want. Now that we have distribution and we add multi-core, by default we get parallelism. So you know, concurrency is how you model your system. Parallelism deals with how you actually execute it. And executing you know, more, you know, so concurrency you model activities happening at the same time, with parallelism, you execute them at the same time. And putting these two together with distribution, we also get two more things. We get scalability because you know, we're able to add commodity hardware and scale horizontally. So through, through multi-core, we scale vertically by adding more cores on a single machine. Through distribution, you know, and commodity hardware, we get scalability because we can add more hardware on the fly. But also reliability. We also get reliability. And why do we get reliability? Well, because we got, can have two processes and we copy the data and the state of these two processes on two separate machines. And to go in and quote Joe Armstrong, if one machine happens to get struck by lightning, uh, you've got a copy of the data on a second machine. And so the user, the end user, won't notice anything which, anything which has gone wrong. So we get these two things. And you know, I didn't think, it took me a while to kind of reach that conclusion. You know, Joe Armstrong you know, used to always go in and say, hey, you, know, you want to buy scalable, fault-tolerant systems? Use Erlang. And so all of us youngsters at the time you know, who were working with him said, oh, you want scalable, reliable systems? Use Erlang. But we never really understood why. This is the reason why. It has to do with the concurrency model, which you know, allows you to distribute the computation across clusters of machines. As soon as you've got distribution, your systems will scale and they'll become reliable. Does that make sense? Right, yes. It took me uh, about 20 years of working with the Beam to actually figure it out. And soon after I actually figured it out, I was lucky enough to get um, Joe Armstrong, uh, Tony Hoare, and Carl Hewitt in the same room. So these three people are you know, some of the luminaries of concurrency. So you know, Carl Hewitt created the actor model. So the actor model is a you know, concurrency model very similar to, you know, to Erlang style concurrency. And he created it more or less at the same time or slightly before you know, Joe Armstrong went in you know, with, you know, with Mike and Robert and created Erlang style concurrency yeah, as we know it today and as we use in Elixir. And he didn't, yeah, he, he used Erlang style concurrency. And, and then we've got Carl Hewitt. Uh, Carl Hewitt, uh, you know, how many of you have had to implement quicksort, the algorithm, when in university? It was invented by Carl Hewitt. Uh, sorry, sorry, by, by Tony Hoare, sorry, by Tony Hoare, sorry. Um, Hoare logic. And he also created um, CSP, you know, so concurrent sequential processes. And so the first question I asked these chaps was, and the first question I asked any language inventor you know, who's come up with something really cool is, what problem were you trying to solve? And Carl Hewitt, um, so I first asked Joe Armstrong, and he was just like, mm, we're trying to figure out how to make systems reliable. You know, and, and act reliably in the presence of failure. I asked Carl Hewitt, hmm, 
I was trying to figure out how to program distributed systems. I asked Tony Hoare, and he replies, oh, I was trying to figure out how to program transputers. So transputers, yeah, predecessor of multicore. So we had three people who came up with very similar ideas and very similar inventions, each working in some phase of it. You know, distribution for Cole Hewitt, parallelism for Tony Hoare, and reliability for, yeah, reliability for uh, Joe Armstrong. And in fact, you know, scalability was also one of the problems they were trying to solve, but you know, it wasn't the main, the main reason why they added concurrence to Erlang like initially was, um, you know, was, uh, was reliability. They realized, they were looking and they realized that in order to understand and realize that a process has failed, you need someone watching it. You need another process. Okay, we need concurrency. And this came you know, from lessons from Mike Williams, so one of the other co-inventors of Erlang, who worked on the very, very first system of um, you know, Ericsson Mobile uh, Network. So uh, this was even before you know, there was a gateway from the mobile telephony network to the fixed network. You can only call a cellular phone. It calls cell phones to cell phones. You know, this was the very first ones. And you know what the concurrency model there was? It was a single workstation with a human being that was, you know, that was a supervisor looking at a screen and when they started 24 hours a day and when they started seeing lots of kind of text scrolling, they knew the system had crashed, the human would go in and quickly restart it manually. So yeah, the system was one process, the human was another. <laughs> you know, how do you automate that? And, and that, that's what they did. So you know, this talk, the, the, this panel and inter, in, in, uh, interviews with all of them are available on YouTube. Just search Talk Concurrency. And I really recommend, uh, yeah, you go see them. Yeah, I mean, Joe and Carl, Joe Armstrong and Carl Hewitt are no longer with us. Uh, this was actually done um, a few months before you know, Joe Armstrong passed away. And I was actually walking him to, to, the, um, to the computer science laboratory, at, to the computer, computer um, science facility at, at Cambridge University. This is the actual green door, which was the original door to the original you know, computing department center and the building where, you know, where everything was housed. And, and Joe already back then had problems breathing and you could see you know, his lungs were probably at 60% you know, capacity at the time. And he passed away soon after and Carl Hewitt passed away during, in 2022. So um, yeah, so yeah, really lucky we're able to bring him into the same room. And that's it, you know. I mean, if you think of it, you know, the future of you know, concurrent programming is functional, uh, mm -hmm. you know, being scaling on multi-core architectures or in distributed environments. And, you know, and it's everywhere from embedded devices all, all the way up to supercomputers. And you, know, you might not be using functional programming on a day-to-day -day basis, but you know, you are, those ideas are being integrated into any modern language because by doing it this way, you solve a lot of, you know, uh, you know, you kind of you, you solve a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the accidental difficulties. You know, this is a great quote for, from Joel Spolsky, where you know, accidental difficulties are those deriving from the fact that you're not using the right tool for the job. You know, actual difficulties, well, that's those are the things you actually should be focusing whilst using the right tools. And yeah, so and that's where your concurrency, I think, is there and is your friend.